Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 as we come to the end of this look at, at, or Ecclesiastes chapter, yeah, 12, I'm sorry. As we come to the end of this this study in the book of Ecclesiastes, and, uh, you know, I'm going to miss it because I miss the confidence I have that knowing every week I'm preaching it's probably the best sermon you've ever heard on that passage. Because it's probably the only sermon you've ever heard on that passage. But as we come to the end of Ecclesiastes, the writer here, he's talked about death. He's talked about what approaches all of us, what awaits all of us. And then there is this summation. right? Because he, he talks about his own life. This seems really strange to us. To see this, it's, some have argued that this is a later editor, and though it's possible, it would not have been uncommon in those days for a writer to refer to themselves in the third person to state their credentials. And I think that's what the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, I think that's what the preacher is doing, because what it comes down to is this idea that it's a shame to have lived and not really known what life is about. It's a shame to go through life and to enjoy life and to, to flourish in life, to have all the possessions and all the things that this world offers. It's a shame if we go through that, but we still miss, it's at the very heart of life, what life is about. And the preacher who has given his, his life, who has devoted his life to the study and the cultivation of, of wisdom, this understanding the world through God's eyes, looking and seeing how God evaluates things, having God's priorities, having God's goals. He, he as he closes this book, is, is helping us see really what life is all about. So look with me, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 12. It says, Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. In the end of the, end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The writer of Ecclesiastes, the preacher here, he's, he's telling us what life is about. And he summarizes his own life. He states his own credentials to say... Here's why you should listen to me. Here's why I know what I'm talking about. Here's why I have devoted my life to the study of wisdom. And, and here's an encouragement for you to do the same. And he gives us three, three truths to remember about life. And the first thing he says is life is about passing on wisdom to others. Life is about passing on wisdom to others. That's, that's what God has given us. The reason we have wisdom, the reason God teaches us, the reason God grows us is so that as we gain wisdom, we are passing on wisdom. We're not to just be depositories of God's truth. We're not just to be those that God teaches, that, that God shows truth through His Word, that God gives wisdom to, and then we just keep it to ourselves. The goal of gaining wisdom is to pass along wisdom. And, and the preacher says that's what he's devoted his life to. And he says that he taught the people knowledge. That's what his life was about. It was about teaching people this wisdom. Besides just being wise, he taught people. In essence, being wise is not worth anything if you keep it to yourself. The preacher was wise... He had all this wisdom, but he taught people. So often we go around and we think, oh, well, I'm a wise person. I've got things figured out and I, I know what to do. But if you're just keeping it to yourself, then it doesn't matter at all. 
If, if all the knowledge that you have about God, all the truth you have about God, the, the, the understanding of His grace... Right? Can I just tell you, it does not matter how much we sing about grace if we're not telling people about grace. Oh, we can understand the, the depths of what God's grace is, but if we're not talking about it, if we're not teaching others about it, if, if we know who God is and we understand what Jesus has done, but we're just keeping it to ourselves, it doesn't matter. The preacher was not just wise... He taught others. And he passed along this wisdom. He passed along this truth of, of who God is and, and how to be in relationship with Him and how to live a life that honors Him. So often we know all the right things, but we're just silent about it. We don't teach anybody else. Parents, this is what being a parent is. It's not just teaching rules, it is passing along wisdom. I think one of the biggest mistakes parents make is they teach their kids what to do and not how to think. Because what happens is, is parents set up these rules in their homes and they force this conformity in their homes, but then the kids leave the home and they don't have to abide by mom and dad's rules anymore. Their parents have taught them rules, but they have not taught them wisdom. They haven't taught them how to think about life. They haven't taught them how to think through the decisions that they make. They haven't taught them how to value right. They've just taught them to avoid wrong. We need to pass along wisdom. But he tells us more about that because he says passing along wisdom involves planning. How did he teach the people knowledge? By weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. Right? Passing along wisdom doesn't just happen. Right? We have to plan, we have to think through how to do it. As a parent, you look for those teachable moments in life. You look for those moments where your children are receptive to wisdom. You have to think through stuff. You have to look for opportunities. Hey. Right? It says that he planned and he studied. He planned, how can I pass this along? He studied what to pass along. He, he crafted these Proverbs. This all was, was effort on his part. This was all work he was doing. Man, I remember growing up, some of the most cherished times in my life were just riding in the car with my dad. And my dad would, would always try and take these opportunities. He'd go somewhere to preach and I'd ride along with him and we'd be driving through the mountains of Kentucky or whatever, and we'd be in the car for just a couple hours, and he'd just start asking me questions, trying to get me to think through some stuff, teaching me things about, about God. And it wasn't ever this formal thing, Michael, today we're going to learn the Baptist Catechism. It was, just, it was just conversation between a father and a son about what mattered most in life. But that took effort on his part. That took planning on his part. And I think so often we all just wait, hoping that opportunities will come instead of looking for opportunities or, or making opportunities to pass along wisdom. Right? Discipling others, passing along wisdom doesn't just happen. We have to look for opportunities and make the most of those opportunities. But passing along wisdom is also about knowing what to say and knowing how to say it. For communication to happen, there has to be somebody who encodes a signal and then somebody who decodes a signal. With, with my, when I'm watching television, somewhere a signal is encoded and it's beamed out to a satellite and then it's beamed into my house where the, the satellite receiver decodes it. When I listen to the radio, there's a signal that's encoded and then decoded by the radio in my car. When you speak... You are encoding, somebody's decoding. And the job of the one speaking is to try and make sure that somebody else is hearing you. Right? We can't just put out stuff and make it so that it's all on the other person to hear us. You see, what? look at what the, the, the preacher does. It says in verse 10, He sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. He says he wrote words of delight. And he wrote words of truth. That is, 
he did two important things. The first thing, he, he wrote these words of truth. Right? So everything he's saying is true. What he's saying is truth. But he presents this truth in a delightful manner. See, we can go to one of two extremes and both of them are ineffective. Sometimes some Christians, they just focus on words of delight. They just say what others want to hear. They just say things that sound good to us. We all know who we're talking about. We all know these kind of messages. The feel good, the God's there to clean up your messes, the God wants you happy. The, the things that are words of delight, the things that sound good, but don't have the whole truth. Then there are others who say words of truth, but there's no delight in it. Right? Those who just kind of beat people over the head with truth. Is it true that God hates sin? Yeah, it's true. But it's also not true that God's just wanting to beat down sinners. But to hear some preachers, you would think that's his goal. You would think God's just sitting, waiting for some of, some of us to sin so he can sock us and make us miserable. And the preacher, he has these words of truth, but he presents them in this delightful manner. If we're going to pass along wisdom, what we have to do is we have to make sure people see how wonderful truth is. That's the thing. Sometimes we talk about truth, but we make it seem so miserable. We make it seem like, like to follow God is this life of pain and this life of misery and this life of just wretchedness. I'll never forget. You know, I, there's a song that I, I hate. Maybe you like it, but sorry. It's a song called Toiling On. Or I think it's called To The Work. But it's just the chorus, toiling on, toiling on. The only time that song is, we sang that at a Baptist Association meeting one time, and I thought, well, that's an appropriate use for it. But <laughs> Other than that, that's just the most miserable. Like, people are going to hear a bunch of Christians singing, we're following God, we're just toiling on. What in the world? Now, what we need to make people see is how wonderful truth is. When God tells us not to do something, God's not saying, I don't want you having any fun and I don't want you being happy. God's saying, don't hurt yourself. When God tells us, here is my plan for life. Here's how a marriage should be. Here's how parents should be. Here, here's how we should think of our money. Here's how we should think of our time. He's not saying be miserable. He's saying, here's what's best for you. But the way we talk about it sometimes, it's like God's just punishing us. If we want to teach wisdom, if we want to pass wisdom along, we have to think about a way to present it so that people see how wonderful, how delightful following God's truth is. And so the preacher says life is about passing on wisdom to others, but secondly, life is about helping others through our words. The point of wisdom... The point of this life of wisdom, he says, is to help others, to use our words, to use our lives to help others. And he, he, he gives two illustrations. He says in verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads. Now, a goad is an ancient cattle prod. It's a big pointed stick. And these cattle herders, they would walk behind the cattle, they would walk behind sheep, and what they would do is they just poke them. Don't go this way. If you go this way, you get poked. And so, you know, they would steer the cattle by just poking them with these big pointy sticks. The reason that the goads were effective was because they hurt. Right? Goads weren't just effective because they were there. Goads were effective because they would hurt that pain. That just little jolt of pain would make the animal go, nope, don't want to go this way. I need to go this way. And the preacher uses this illustration to describe what words of wisdom are. Because it's not always what we think, but 
what he's saying is wisdom can be painful, but it's necessary to get us moving in the right direction. The goal is not to hurt, but let's just be honest. We're all so ornery that sometimes the only thing that awakens us to what we need to do is a little bit of pain. Sometimes the only thing that gets us going in the direction we need to go is a little bit of pain. When Sarah comes and says, Michael, uh, there's something you need to work on. I'll be honest, my initial response is not, oh, good. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Because I know I've done something wrong. But it's that initial sting, that initial realization that I've done something that hurts her, I've done something I should not do, or I've got a tone that needs to be fixed. It's that, it's that little jolt of pain that God uses to help me steer my life in the right direction. And sometimes we're so afraid of hurting somebody that we don't say anything. But the preacher is saying that that's what wisdom will always do because wisdom will always awaken us to our sinfulness and that's always going to hurt. It doesn't ever feel good to be told you're a sinner. It doesn't ever feel good to be pointed out that you're doing something wrong. But worse and more unloving than that initial jolt of pain of hurting somebody by pointing out what is wrong in their life is to let them just walk headlong into sin and destruction. We say, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to say anything to them. I don't want to go to them. I don't want to help them go in the right direction. But what we do is we just stand by and watch them walk into death. We stand by and we watch them walk right into sinfulness to plunge headlong into a life of destruction where they hurt themselves and those around them. The preacher says that, that we have been given this task not to take our opinions, not to take our feelings, not to take our, our approximation of things and our view of life, but to take wisdom, to take God's words, to take God's truth. And as we share that with others, it may sting just a little bit, when we share it with others or when others share it with us, it may sting just a little bit. But it's what's necessary to get a life moving in the right direction. But not only does he say they're like goads, he says they're like tent pegs. Now, my translation, the ESV, says they're like nails firmly fixed. The word in the Hebrew best describes tent pegs. And what does a tent peg do? It holds the tent down. It keeps it from being blown away. You would build this tent. You would stake these nails, these pegs in the ground to keep it from just being blown off during the night. And the writer, the preacher, that's what he says wisdom is like. These words of wisdom that, that we share with others, these words of wisdom that people put in our life, they are what give us security and stability in our lives what wisdom does for us. It, it keeps our life from being blown away. We all need wisdom in our life. We all need to help others with wisdom in their lives so that life doesn't just get blown away. Right? Sometimes we get so ambitious or we just get caught up in the moment. Right? The whole country right now is in Powerball mania. Everybody wants to win this Powerball jackpot. People think that if I win this, my life is going to change. Everything will be good. All my problems will be taken care of. Listen, just give that money to the Lottie Moon, and I promise you, more good will come from it. And you have just the same chance of being a billionaire. Right? But people are, are, are just caught up. They're wanting this. They're, they're thinking... I'm going to do this. And sometimes we get these, these harebrained ideas. We get caught up in a moment. And we think, here's what I'm going to do. And here's how I'm going to live. And we just want to run off in some direction. But it's a wisdom that holds our life down. It's wisdom that, that says that $500 million, probably not going to win it. Really don't need it. I have no clue what I'd do with that much money if I got it. 
for me to put money into this system that preys on the ambitions of others and takes their money and oppresses people. That's just to buy into that system and to be a part of it. See, wisdom helps us think through stuff. Wisdom helps us not just let our life be blown off. It's wisdom that helps us when we see sin approaching. It's wisdom when we're tempted by sin. It's wisdom when we're tempted to do something that would hurt ourselves that says, that's not what's best. It's just going to hurt you. That's going to destroy your life. That's going to put you in a bad situation. Here's what's better. And he says that wisdom gives stability and security to my life because it just helps me being blown from one side of life to the other from one whim to the next and it keeps my life stable but most of all what life is about is using wisdom to honor God he says in verse 12 my son beware of anything beyond these of making many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh But what does he say there in verse 11? The words of the wise, these collected sayings, where do they come from? He says they come from the one shepherd. What he says there is God is the source of all wisdom. All wisdom in life comes from God. Not most wisdom, not the best wisdom, all wisdom comes from God. From God. There is no wisdom outside of God. Wisdom does not run parallel with God. Wisdom, all wisdom, is from God. He says that, that these, these, the words of the wise, these collected sayings that he's talking about, these helpful proverbs, they all come from this one shepherd. They come from God. He says, the making of books, there is no end, and of much study, there is weariness. Now, he's not... He's not attacking books. He's not saying books are a bad thing. What he's doing is he's attacking the idea of human wisdom. If you just want to be overwhelmed, go into a bookstore and look at the self-help section. There are so many books that say, here's how you can make your life better. Why, if you just imagine, if you imagine, if you vision, if you positive, use positive mental energy to focus on the life you want, then you'll, you'll give it. The universe will give it to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, here's what you need. You, if you just need to live this kind of life. You go in and, and these books, all these books that are the compilation of human wisdom about what life is about and how life is to be lived and the goals in life. You just start reading through those. You look through those. You begin to get tired. You begin to get worn out because they all just contradict one another. Some say you have to wait. Some say you have to work. And some say you need to do this. And others say you need to do that. And some say you got to have crystals. And some say you got to go get a good education. And, and it's just weariness because all of these ideas, all of the world's wisdom is based on the idea that we are good enough and we are strong enough and we have the capacity in ourselves to do what is necessary and good in life. And so we try and we buy into this stuff and we, we buy into the world's wisdom and I just try harder and I work more at it and I think more good thoughts and I say more good things and nothing happens. And I just get, I, I get worn out and I get tired because I'm trying to do all this stuff But it just creates this weariness. It just leaves me with nothing because I'm counting on myself and I'm counting on my own abilities and I'm counting on my own strength. And I just don't have enough. I can't do it. But he says there's one shepherd who's protecting me and providing for me. There's one shepherd who doesn't give weariness, but who gives rest. There is one shepherd who doesn't bombard us with all these opinions, but who gives us truth. And the preacher's talking about God. He's saying, this is where all wisdom comes from. This is where all truth comes from. It comes from God. And so in it, if, if we want to live a life that's not just attacked and not weighed down and, and worn down by weariness, our only hope 
is to follow the one shepherd. Not a whole bunch of shepherds, not a whole bunch of ideas, but the one. And the preacher says, it's from God that I get all my wisdom. It's from God. I think one of our biggest problems as churches, our biggest problems as Christians, is we think that God is just one source of wisdom among others. I'm not talking about religions. I'm not saying that we we buy into this idea that God has... Is, is equal with other gods. But like one trend I see is sometimes churches get as much wisdom from the Bible as they get from corporate America about how to run a church. They look at how corporate America does things and they look at, at how corporate America does stuff and they think, well, we've got to implement these. And so a church just becomes another capitalistic, consumer-driven enterprise. Problem is... Church isn't a corporation. Church isn't a business. Church is the body of Christ. And so when we're trying to learn from them how to do church and how to run an organization, we're trying to run an organization with the wrong purpose. A lot of Christians, they'll go and they, they will, will look at the Bible and they'll take it as one source of wisdom, but then they have no problem going and getting these other things that use God as a vague word instead of the holy creator of the universe, and they just sort of lump all this stuff together. And a lot of Christianity is nothing more than positive thinking. If we just say good things, then good things will happen. If we just do good for others, then good will happen to us. And historians have have documented how whole religious movements have been born out of psychiatry, out of out of new ideas and and and, and positive thinking movements. And they permeate all of Christianity today. And there is one shepherd. There is only one whose truth can lead us, only one whose truth can protect us, only one whose truth can feed us. And as his people, we follow him. That's why Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. We don't follow him as one among many, we follow him alone. And the shepherd says that the only source of wisdom in life is, is the one true shepherd. And he says, beware of anything beyond that. If I am basing my life on the way this world lives and the, wor- the way this world thinks, I'm in trouble. My only hope is to base my life to accept the wisdom that God alone gives. But he doesn't just say God is the source of wisdom. He says God is the end of wisdom. That is, God is the goal of our wisdom. We get our wisdom from God so that in turn our lives can honor God. He says in verse 13, the end of the matter, the goal of life, all has been heard, fear God and keep His commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Part of the reason that studying books and writing books is so weary is because it's all just theoretical. I took a class in seminary. One of my doctoral seminars was on the doctrine of the church. And there were about 30 of us in the class. And the professor said on the first day, he said, how many of you all have full-time positions at church, at a church right now? And I raised my hand, and there were about three others in the class who raised their hand. And I remember thinking to myself, for the other 26 of y'all, I don't care what you think. Because it's all theory at this point to you. And to actually be in a church and to serve in a church is so much different than to just sit around in a classroom and debate theories about church government and how a church should work and how a church should operate. And so often for us, wisdom is just theoretical. Here's what I should do. Or we sit around, here's what I would do in this situation. Here's how I would live now. 
If, if a Muslim terrorist came in and said, would you give your life for Christ? How would you respond? Well, what I would say is, and it's all at this theoretical level. But what the writer says is, true wisdom is lived out at a practical level. It's not just something in our heads. It's something that we live out in our lives. Fear God and obey His commandments. He doesn't say, study God and know His commandments. Fear God. Be in that, live in that fellowship with Him and obey His commandments. The writer says, what is life about? The preacher saying life is about fearing God. It's about living in that fellowship with Him and obeying His commandments. If I know what is right, but I don't do it, it doesn't matter. If I know what is true, but I don't live it out, it doesn't matter. If we were to take tests, we all know the right things. We all know the right answers. But what really matters is how we live them out on a daily basis. What really matters is how we treat others that we don't like. What really matters is how we respond when life is unfair. What really matters is how we trust God when the bottom of our life falls out. All the theoretical stuff, all the knowledge, all the assumptions, all the opinions about life do not matter. What matters is how we live out the truth. What matters is how we show on a daily basis our love for God and our allegiance to Him in obeying His commandments. And it says there, it says, for this is the whole of man. Now, my translation, and perhaps yours, says the whole duty of man. And translators, for the sake of clarity, added that word. But literally in the Hebrew, it just says, to fear God and obey His commandments is the whole of man. He's saying that's what life's about. Fearing God and obeying His commandments, it's not just our duty, it is our essence. It's not just something we have to do. It's not just a task for us to perform. It's not just rules for us to follow. It is the very fiber of our life. Life is about knowing God and being in fellowship with God by obeying His commandments. God created us for fellowship with Him. That's what God created humanity for. That's why He created them in the garden. He created them to exist in this loving relationship with Him. But Adam and Eve sinned and they broke that fellowship. They turned their backs on God. But we are created to have that fellowship with God. That is why He gave us life. is So we could know Him. So we could give our lives back to Him so that we could use it to serve Him. And He is not saying that, that knowing God and living in fellowship with Him and, and obeying Him is just something we have to do. It's not just a chore. It's not just a routine. It's not just a, a ritual. He is saying it is what life itself is about. In essence, what He is saying is a life lived apart from fellowship with God is a life that never finds its purpose. Life lived apart from fellowship with God is a life that never celebrates its meaning. The creator of the universe created humanity alone so that he could show his love to them. And the only way I can fully live, the only way I can truly enjoy life, the only way I can really experience life to his, its fullest is to love God, to fear Him, and obey His commandments. Because if, if, I, if I live in that fellowship with God, then the response of that, the result of me living in that fellowship with God, is that I will obey His commandments. And the preacher's saying that's what life is about. And then in verse 14... Because God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Nothing I do is hidden from God. 
God knows every thought I have. God doesn't just see my action. He sees the motivation behind my action. He knows my heart. He sees the things I do when no one else is around. He knows what I do when no one's looking. And everything, everything is brought before God. So what life is about is it's about living that life in fellowship with Him to know that when I stand before Him because of what Christ has done, I will be accepted. It's about living my life and taking the, the life that Christ has given me through my faith in Him and using it to honor Him and using it for His glory. See, so many people misunderstand the book of Ecclesiastes. They read that word vanity and they, they, they use our understanding of vanity. And so people have argued that the, the writer of Ecclesiastes says nothing in life matters. But really, what does he end with? What the book of Ecclesiastes is about is that everything matters. Not that nothing matters, but that everything matters. That the things I think matter and the motivations I have matter and the things I do when no one else is around matter. It's not just doing good when others see me. It's not just living a certain way when I'm known. It's everything about my life being lived to honor God. It's about everything about my life being lived with conf in conformity to His wisdom. It's about my life following the one shepherd. That's what life is about. God created me and God gave me this life so that I glorify Him with it. He has given me His wisdom to help me think through the decisions I make. He's given me His wisdom to help me know the difference between right and wrong. He's given me His wisdom to help me see how I can care for and bless others. And I take all that God has given me, and I take all these gifts of His grace, knowing that one day I stand accountable for them. One day I stand before God. Not just for the good things or the bad things that I did. Not just for what people saw. But whether or not my life conformed to His wisdom. Whether or not my life was lived following the one shepherd. And what life is about is about taking all that God has given me so that I can use it for Him. That's what Ecclesiastes has been talking about. It's not about God giving us wealth so we can use it for ourselves. It's not about God giving us power so we can use it for ourselves. It's not about God giving us notoriety so we can use it for ourselves. It's not about God giving us stuff so we can use it for ourselves. It's about taking whatever God gives us, our possessions and, and, and our, our position and, and our stuff, and, and taking creation itself, taking the wisdom that He has given us through His Word. It's about using that to give honor to Him and to glorify Him. It's a shame to live life and to miss what it's about. It's a tragedy to go through life, to enjoy God's creation, to enjoy the blessings He pours out before us, but to miss that it's all about Him. And if you're here this morning and you are caught up in that idea that we all buy into from time to time that life is about me being happy and life is about me being content and life is about me being satisfied and life is about me having and life is about me getting what I want. The reality is, is you can have everything you ever dreamed of and still miss what life is about. Because the only way we know life, the only way we enjoy life, the only way we truly live life 
is when we follow the one shepherd. So the question we have to ask ourselves, is my life following Him? Is my life following His wisdom? Am I trusting in Him alone to protect me, to provide for me? Am I trusting in Him alone to give me security and meaning and purpose? Do I hear His voice? And do I answer? Let's bow our heads. If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says of Christ that He was a shepherd, but He was a shepherd who laid down His life for His sheep. See, Jesus didn't just come to tell us what to do. Jesus didn't just come to force us into a system of rules. Jesus came to show us grace and to give us love. And He showed that through the sacrifice of His own life. He showed you and me how much He loves us. He showed you and me how much He cares for us by dying. So that we could live. He died to protect us from our sin. He died to protect us from ourselves. When I understand that, then I realize anybody who loves me that much is somebody I want to follow, somebody I can trust with anything. And if you've never given your heart to Him, today is the day to do that. Today is the day to put your faith in what Christ has done. Today is the day that says, I'm going to stop living for myself. And I'm going to live for Christ. I'm going to give my life to Him. But here's the thing. is even Christians, we go through seasons of our life where it's not about God and it's about us. We go through seasons of our life where... It's just about, God, what can you do for me? And God, how can you make me happy? And God, how can you meet my needs? We go through seasons where we, we know what God's Word says, but we don't love Him enough to live it out. Maybe today you say, I hear the shepherd calling, but I'm tired of ignoring it. I hear the shepherd calling, but I need to follow Him. I, I I need to to get my life back on track. I need to stop following all the siren calls of this world, and I need to follow Christ alone. I don't know how God leads, but however He leads, we need to follow. Father, we love You. Thank You for Your love for us. Thank You for the way that You have shepherded us. Father, thank You for the words of wisdom that You give us. Lord, may we never just hear them, but may we obey them. May we understand that the whole of life is to fear you and to obey you. That's not just a threat from you so that we avoid hell. Father, that is is the, the fullest life that we can live. And so, Father, I pray that that we would do that. Pray that we would never be seduced by the cries of this world. But Father, that we would always live knowing that you're the one who gave us life, you're the one who gives us wisdom, and you're the one to whom we answer for how we use our life and for how we obey your wisdom. May that be what motivate our decisions and our affections and everything we do. May we follow the one shepherd. It's in the name of Christ we pray.